Welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host in this episode. Our guest is Jeff McCullough from Hello Saints. Hello Saints is a very popular YouTube channel that uh, I think has almost 30,000 subscribers to it already. And I think he just started about nine months ago as I looked at it. But uh, Jeff is basically uh, journaling, if you will, video journaling his, his exploration of the LDS church. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I want to go over a couple of things here. You've, you know, throughout your channel, you have, um, you know, you, you cover different topics. You know, one of the things you talk about is the difference with theology. You talk about the three levels of heaven. You talk about the temple, your visits to the church, uh, your experience with the the missionaries, et cetera. What, I mean, what brought you to this point? Why did you get interested in the Latter-day Saints? Do you have a background with the Latter-day Saints at any point? Um, no, as a matter of fact, that's, that's what drew me into it is, is it being so foreign and unfamiliar to me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, as I've ex- explained on a lot of other podcasts, it's, it's not something that I anticipated getting into. Um, it sort of just happened in sequence with other things that were going on in my life. You know, I grew up Protestant evangelical. I've been involved in, a pastoral ministry at a, in a congregational level for the past 15 years or so, and in other capacities, even longer than that. So when I was able to, during the pandemic, sort of take my um, undergrad focus, which was production with my you know, grad school occupational focus, which is faith-based pastoral ministry, put those together during the pandemic that coincided with um, a national parks trip that me and my family took during the pandemic um, out West and spent some time in Salt Lake city with some friends. And as I was talking to those friends, they were explaining to me the LDS culture. And my first question was, what is LDS? Mm -hmm. And from there, she began to explain to me um, just what that inner mountain corridor is like culturally because of the spiritual heritage that exists there. Um, it was kind of interesting to me at the time, but I didn't think too much of it. But over the next few months, um, the more I began to enjoy more this idea of blending media with with faith, um, ministry, whatever you want to call it, and a growing desire to learn more about Latter-day Saint belief and culture and people, uh, I just decided, you know what, why don't I just put all this together and I'll just chronicle this journey and um, maybe a couple hundred, few hundred people on on YouTube, Latter Day Saints evangelicals. I don't know. Would like to learn with me or watch me learn, and that really was how it all started. About uh, at some point over the past year or so. so. I want to back up a little bit. I want to learn more about you to begin with. You 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 were a pastor for several years. What were you always a spiritual person? You know, growing up, what what dis, what made you decide to become a pastor and and be involved with ministry? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yes, I I grew up in a very spiritually minded, spiritually hearted family. Um, faith was always important to us. Um, the Bible has always been important to us. The idea of having a of relationship with Jesus was central to my upbringing with my parents, with my siblings. And I grew up going to church uh, and we were there every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday evening. And um, so I, I grew up in, in the faith, but as far as my, what I would call spiritual awakening, where it became my own thing and not just my upbringing was probably when I was around uh, junior high age and uh, the light bulb just went on when I started to realize that uh, um, it's not about religion. It's about relationship. God is not calling me into religion and ritual and and religious devotion. He's calling me into a thriving relationship with him. And my life just continued to be more and more transformed uh, along that path through high, through high school. I grew up in a a suburb of St. Louis that was quite large, but in high school, we moved to a farm town and it was primarily like a German Catholic K 
community, old mining community. So I was surrounded by Catholics. I was like one of the only Protestant kids at the school and I started a Bible study. So you have this Protestant kid leading all these Catholics in a Bible study, which was just fantastic. And that was sort of a foray into me appreciating sort of an interfaith dialogue and, and look at the word and truth and who God is and understanding where we're similar, where we're different. Um, and then I went to a Methodist un, uh, undergrad school. And for those who aren't familiar with the sort of the heritage of the Methodist church, um, it's the Wesley brothers and they're enlightenment thinkers. And um, they were all about question everything, you know, don't just believe, know what you believe and why you believe it. And the, what, with the Wesleyan quadrilateral and all the enlightenment ways to kick the tires on faith. And we would even take trips. <clears throat> we were required to take a trip up to Chicago where we went to um, an Episcopalian church downtown, a mega evangelical church in the suburbs called Willow Creek, um, a Jewish synagogue and an Islamic mosque. And as students, we we went into these cross-faith, cross-denominational, you know, interfaith environments and there again another building block in feeling that it's okay and it's safe to look at other faiths so um all of that just remains sort of the fabric of my spiritual um, journey um graduated college started in uh radio for a few years in the st louis area worked for you know the blues the car the, the rams when they were in st louis um <clears throat> And then worked in online marketing. And while I was in that environment of uh, marketing, website design, um, I just was feeling like every day I was going to work, helping the company make money. And that was super hollow to me. It, it was very unfulfilling. You wanted, you wanted and more purpose. I just felt I wanted more purpose. The way I, would, I thought about it at the time was I want to do things that are a little bit more directly tied to an eternal impact. Not to say that someone who works in an office can't have an eternal impact, but it was really feeling that draw into pastoral ministry at that point. And that started a you know 15-year journey of, of uh, being ordained, going to seminary, um, getting a graduate degree in biblical studies and pastoring all through those years. So Now, you've got a family. Mm -hmm. Uh were you already a pastor when you met your wife or, or was that later on? No, I met my wife in college. She was okay. 17. I was 19. Okay. And, um, so we, she, she spent, she went along this whole journey with you. She did. Yeah. I mean, she's, she's as close to a high school sweetheart as you can get. Mm -hmm. And then we, we just journeyed. We, we did a little bit of ministry together at the college we went to because she was hired right before and, and during the first couple of years of our marriage as a, a resident director at this Christian liberal arts school. So we were, we were pouring into students' lives um, and, and enjoyed doing that. <clears throat> um, but we weren't planning on getting into pastoral ministry at that point. Yeah. Okay. So you've had, you've always been spiritual. We'll just say that you've had, you felt like you've had a calling and, and maybe that's what you feel with what you're doing right now. I, I don't know. I'll just ask you, do you, do you feel a calling for what you're doing? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, in in this peculiar world that we're living in now that feels like an alternate universe since 2020, um, there's so much um, deconstruction taking place on so many levels. I, I, I would maybe even say on an institutional level, you know, everything's being called into question um, from politics to, um, you know, s social structures as it pertains to race, as it pertains to marriage. Um, and as it pertains to, to faith, the church, what is organized church? What is it supposed to be? So uh, I personally believe that every, every one of those things that I named have spiritual underpinnings and, um, where we could scatter into our own areas of comfort and hunker down, um, why not look outward and, and try to connect and find commonalities with individuals where spirituality is becoming more and more where, where people are jet. It's like they're, they jettison anything spiritual. Um, and I think that that's sad. So um, that's, that's part of what I'm, I'm pursuing in this sort of interfaith conversation that, that I'm doing on hello saints. Yeah. I don't know if you know about some of the church history there, but that's, 
a lot of the Joseph Smith family had converted to Methodists. Um, I, I did early yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Joseph Smith was saying he was thinking cl- strongly about becoming a Methodist. Yeah. The Methodist the church the was blowing vision. up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. During the second great awakening, the, the Methodist church was blowing up in America. Mm-hmm. And um, so I know there's a lot of ties there. Yeah. So uh, you start, you start this up, you say, Hey, I'm going to start this YouTube channel up. I don't know much about the Latter-day Saints. Give me your impression of what you did know before you started investigating. I couldn't tell you the difference between a Latter-day Saint and a Jehovah's Witness, which is very typical um, in the Midwest and in the Bible Belt. We we don't really know. Um, There was a temple built, I think, in the 90s um, off of um, 64 in St. Louis in Creve Coeur. And I remember when they built it and me driving by it and being like, what is that gold angel on this temple? Like I knew it was tied to, I, I thought it was Mormonism, but I wasn't totally sure. I, I knew very little. Um, I, I think the first um, like couple months that I was even looking into the Latter-day Saint church, even in the past few years, um, I, I kept calling him John Smith instead of Joseph Smith. I mean, it was that unfamiliar to me. Yeah. Um, I had touched on Mormonism proper uh, or the restoration at a couple points in some of, you know, classes that I taught and some of those things, just, just making reference to, you know, other religious minorities in America, but I was just regurgitating stuff I had read. I had not really researched it myself. So as you start getting familiar with things, are you researching things or are you, is it mostly meeting people and going to a chapel what what's your process as you start out initially it was research it was um reading a lot of books and watching a lot of videos on youtube um naturally i'm my starting point is from an evangelical perspective sure so the first couple books i read were people who had come out of the Latter-day Saint church. And, and they, the reason why I started there is because that was helping me sort of connect the dots, the, this whole, the whole quest of where are we similar, where are we different? That was actually really helpful for somebody who came out of the Latter-day Saint church and converted to evangelical Christianity. They could sort of explain those similarities and differences. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, one of them was pretty critical. The other one, not quite as much it was just a little bit more upfront about their experience. But then I got into reading like rough stone rolling and um, I read, um, what is it? Is it desert prophet uh, Brigham Young biography? Um, so that I, it started with that, but then I started to make connections with people, um, pastors in the Utah area, friends that I have out there, which eventually led to people who were either practicing Latter-day Saints or former Latter-day Saints. So you finally end up going to a chapel and, and I've never been, you have never been. Oh, why did I've been inside. I, I went inside of one for the first time about a month ago to shoot a video okay. because um, there's a local okay, Latter-day cool. Saint who, okay. who invited me to basically give me a tour of a chapel on like a Thursday afternoon, but I have yet to go to church on a Sunday morning. Oh, you That's gotta go. coming soon. You got to check it out. I know. Yeah. People will be very nice. Especially after going to general conference. I, I mean, I think let's, it'll feel so, so, so let's go to that. Right. So you've, you know, not many people have gone to general conference before they've gone to church. And I think you got tickets from a mutual friend of ours, but yeah. uh, what, t- give, give your impression of what, what general conference was like for me, for you, a, a, an evangelical pastor going to Latter-day Saint general conference. What was your impression? All of this it, it has the same trailhead. Anytime I do this, same trailhead wow, this is really familiar in a lot of ways. And man, this is super foreign in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really, it, that, that's, that was the tension that has drawn me into this because there's something inviting and disarming about how, how familiar it feels. And there's something that's making me recoil at how mm-hmm. foreign it is. So that tension, call me, I don't know, a glutton for discomfort. I, I, I it causes me to just want to look a little bit closer. So yeah, when I went to a uh, general conference, um, it felt, it felt like what, what I would say in a Protestant sense, it felt like old school church. 
everybody's dressed in their Sunday best. In my context, people don't really dress in ties and dresses anymore for church. It's very kind of come as you are. Um, so it felt a little bit like old, old school church, very traditional Protestant Christianity. Um, I felt that way in the conference center with the giant choir, with the organ. That feels very old church to me because I, I mean, I grew up in and I still kind of operate in a context where it's a lot more, you know, a worship band. You don't really have choirs. There's no organs and that's it's a Hammond B or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so. But then but then it was very foreign in in another regard where. Just all the prophet and the presence of the prophet was very different to me. Um, the um, references to Book of Mormon, um, you know, Third Nephi, you know, Alma, like all these scriptural references that I'm like, kind of heard of it, maybe. That would be that was I very. Mean, I mean, that's that's so under that would be so strange. Yeah. That would be. I mean, you're you're referencing these names as if you're talking about Moses or, uh, <laughs> you know, some other biblical prophet or Peter or somebody, and it's right. like, who are these people? Yeah. Right. And then so that's that's sort of the 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 in a vacuum what I was experiencing. There was there were some subplots, which you'd see you see in the video that I made that was really I guess it added some drama, but really it added some frustration and dissonance in my mind and in my heart. And that was this evangelical presence um, that just really bothered me. And I, I, I know I get in trouble for saying that, but um this specifically the street preachers really bothered me. Like, what, what are you doing? Like yelling at people while they're trying to do their church thing. I, I don't for the life of me understand what that accomplishes. And, and since I even referenced that in that video, I've had plenty of conversations with, it's a, it's a very sm- small minority of um, Protestants who are like, what are you talking about? Like, that's what we're called to do. That's what preaching is. We're called to proclaim the truth. It's just, it's not inviting though. I don't, I don't see Jesus preaching and proclaiming and really condemning to a passerby, passer buyers and, and to crowds. I, I see him speaking a disarming, loving truth to a captive audience on a hillside. And I see him confronting those who are being religiously oppressive, who are actually obstructing the mission of the father but i don't see him standing on street corners screaming at people and i, I again I'm, I'm all of i could get super worked up on that for a while um and there I were think, some other groups uh, by there Jeff, by the way and unfortunately for those that live we'll call it the book of mormon belt for those mm-hmm. that live in that book of mormon belt and and that is their culture and that's what's around them the unfortunate thing i think is that for them they see that and that's that's most of the representation they get on evangelicals, right? Because they don't know as many necessarily, right? They're, they're and that not. That is a tiny, tiny representation. Yeah, and it is. That's yeah. very important to state. To state. It's a yeah. very tiny slice of of Protestantism. Yeah, right. And then you had other groups there that were passing out tracks and wanting to have conversations, and they were generally very friendly. They weren't intrusive. They they didn't seem to be trying to ambush people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I talk about this in the video, still not my approach, but I think they might be well-meaning, but, but just in general, this whole idea of we are going to surround you and wait for you to go in to your thing and wait for you to come out of your thing. And like it, like we're going to shoot these fish in a barrel type of approach. It's super <laughs> peculiar and bizarre to me. I, I just wanted to like stand up on a, you know, planter and just yell go away (laughs) leave them alone if you want to talk to them then find a latter-day saint that on a relational level you can engage with as opposed to just barking at a crowd i get in trouble for saying these types of things so i should probably stop now but that 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 was that was a um i had a visceral reaction to that and i wasn't expecting to see that whenever i was at general conference Mm -hmm. so yeah um but most everything in there, right? The, the the hymns are maybe a little bit different. Did you think? Did you think anything? The hymns were strange to you. I mean, they're probably some of them. No, are not really. As far as like what they're saying in the hymns. Did anything stand well, out? Well, mm, no. Some of them are hymns that that I would sing. Um, so the bagpipe guy, I asked if I could record him and asked if he would play a song. He played "Come Thou Fount," 
Um, I love Come Thou Found. I've sung it 500 times in church. Yeah. Um, I think I heard All Creatures of Our God and King, Probably. which we have, I, I didn't notice while I was there, we have a different third verse because we say praise, praise a father, praise a son, praise Holy Spirit three in one. That mm -hmm. verse was not sung um, Interesting. at General Conference. Okay. But um, yeah, I mean, none of the hymns really struck me as uh, weird or foreign. I, we don't do a, a ton of hymn singing in my context anymore. But there's some beautiful hymns that um, the 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 choir just nailed it. They're so good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, you know, early on, it looks like you you had you talked about the temple a little bit. What have you gathered so far? The information you've gathered about because the temple is right. It's very separate, so there's not a whole lot of talk about it. Um, we hold a few things that are very sacred and not as secret. So what? What is your impression so far of what you've learned about this? I mean, did you hear, you probably heard about the announcements. Were you there when they did the announcements on how many new temples being? Uh, I think that was the day after I okay. was there or that late, but I, I, but, I but I'm them, guessing you get that the sense that we're very temple centered as, as, yes. as a people. What, what, yeah. what are your thoughts? What have you learned about the temple so far? Well, I'll say prior to this journey, the temple is um, the thing that is, that, that makes Mormonism very, mysterious to outsiders um there was always this like lore around latter-day satan temples um as far as i understood it that like oh they do secret things in there so yeah, anything yeah. i'm talking about that, that oh, temple. I've heard stories. <laughs> yeah that temple in the st louis area I, every time we would drive by it um i remember like thinking because of these you know distant rumors like i wonder what goes on in there like why don't they let anybody else in there that was always my question like why mm -hmm. couldn't i just go in there what am i going to see that i'm not supposed to see yeah. Um, now, since then, one of the first videos I did, I, the temple, the temple is, is a very powerful, um, iconic sort of aspect to the Latter-day Saint worship and, and tradition that is, is very captivating to me. Um, and I think I would say to a lot of, uh, protestants because we we don't know what what you guys do in there i thought that you guys go to church there on sundays mm -hmm. um i didn't even know that meeting houses existed until yeah, I went it's to closed on sundays <laughs> right right so what i've learned so far um on one hand has been clarifying on another hand is still pretty mysterious to me um the clarifying aspect of the temple as I'm learning um, in the first, I don't know, six to eight months of me learning about the Restoration and Book of Mormon, I was under the impression that it is a works-based religion, um, that you cannot get to heaven <clears throat> unless you enter through the temple and, and do all the temple works. I've since um, realized that that's not the case, that that is important pertaining to progression and exaltation and um, your place, your standing in the celestial kingdom. Mm -hmm. But um, so that's been a clarifying thing. It's still a bit mysterious as to what goes on in there. I mean, I know that there's, you know, endowments and proxy baptisms, ceilings, um, but I, I've not, I've not stepped foot. And here's the thing. I, for me, it just my opinion, gospel by Greg here. I, I think that we don't talk about it enough. There are some very sacred things there, but, we don't talk about it enough, even amongst ourselves, right? And 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 you say you don't know what goes on in there. I think a lot of members that go to the temple regularly don't really know what's happening in there, actually, and uh, because there's not a lot of discussion on it. There used to be, yeah, back and, in the day, and there, there's not a lot of discussion on it now, right? And then you've got the Masonic ties that I've learned about, which makes it mm -hmm. that kind of puts it back into a realm of mystery for me. Mm -hmm. um, because, Maybe even on the recoil side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of that came from even whenever I was reading Rough Stone Rolling and some references to how in the latter, not just years, but even months of Joseph's life, that Masonic um, role began to be brought into temple practices and some of that other stuff. So um, I, I watched a Now You Know video that the church put out on masonry, and they basically said, you know, masonry is something that we 
don't necessarily claim, but at the same time, we're not opposed to people who are involved in Masonic, um, you know, communities. Yeah. That's, that's not how it's viewed outside of the Latter-day Saint church and Protestant circles. We, uh, we stay away from some of the Masonic stuff. So right. the yeah. blending of that from a Protestant standpoint is like, what do you, yeah. what are you guys intertwining into this worship of God? Yeah. So there's not really any, any intertwining, I wouldn't say, um, outside of church history. Mm. Um, you know, if you go back to Joseph Smith and others, you know, they were, they were Masons and yeah. they, they did that for a couple of reasons. One was protection because they were being attacked all the time. And the other was, is that Joseph Smith is learning some things in there that, that kind of quasi get used in the temple, but it's, it's not usually the way it's portrayed. It's just not, mm. it's not the way it's portrayed, but so there's, you know, nobody in the, no Latter-day Saint thinks to themselves, well, there's mingling here with masonry. You know, it's just not, that's the farthest, yeah. that the, the, the Masons are as foreign to us as we were to you, hmm. right? It wouldn't, yeah. there wouldn't be any kind of a, a mingling there. What's, I, I don't know a single Mason myself. I don't. Yeah. Well, what about, if you don't mind me asking on that topic, um, I've heard very little, but like rumors of the whole idea of like handshakes or like clasps and mm -hmm. like even certain words that you, you have to like not passwords or whatever that you have to remember mm -hmm. um, that are tied to temple ritual and even in the afterlife. Some was yeah. some of that brought in from Masonic ritual. Well, that that's that's a very nuanced thing, and that's something I would talk to you more off okay. off camera on. And, gotcha. and go through okay. that. The, the, the answer is kind of, <laughs> okay. The yeah. answer is kind of. And so I that's mean, one of those go, topics yeah, that I'm, like, I'm wanting to like explore more. Cause I've not looked into it very yeah, much. Yeah. And I can talk to you more about that. It's, uh, you know, oh, when we talked, you know, uh, recently I was telling you about kind of the things, some of my interpreters and how I go through some, uh, help people to understand the scriptures a little bit better. One of them was, and I think we talked about the Royal procession, didn't we? Yeah. But mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's really what the temple is. Mm. It's it's it is it is the when Christ Christ last week is pretty much the manifestation of the temple. And and so it's it's the king coming in. It's a uh, a, a procession going through uh, Aaronic and priest and Melchizedek priesthoods. It's arriving at the temple, arriving at the veil. And then there should be a coronation, you know, and again, for, for Jesus, there wasn't, he was actually crowned secularly, right, by the Romans instead. So it, it's kind of the same idea if people thought about it that way. It, this is a, it's a royal procession that mm -hmm. you're going through, which was tied anciently to the ancient Israelite drama, a temple drama. Sure. They, they're supposed yeah. to go together. Yeah. Right. So it's, and it's, that's, uh, I love the symbolism that um, Latter-day Saints are able to draw out to certain aspects of that. And, and because I think it's important, we can, if, if we, um, if we reduce faith down to just certain axioms, but we don't see sort of the narrative interplay that exists between um, how God has been moving in and amongst his people and how he's inviting us to understand him in, in ways through symbolism, like communion. Mm -hmm. And I, and I know that this probably isn't shared by a lot of Latter-day Saints, but even in baptism, um, the symbolism that exists in baptism um, I think that that's, that's a really, um, great way to sort of contextualize some of those things. Um, it, it actually, what it reminds me of, even in the book of Hebrews, how it talks about specifically about the temple, uh, I think it's in chapter nine or chapter 11, how those things are sort of a representation of heavenly things, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, it, their, their physical representations that symbolize how we can understand this divine realm of of god's presence in his throne room and, and his his um his will being carried out so yeah that's great it's also and we can get to this a little bit later but it's you know for latter-day saints our bodies are really important you know typically throughout most of christianity it's kind of like well the body's kind of the evil part it's the carnal and um you know when we go beyond and, and pass into the next world we don't need to worry about the body anymore for us, it's very different, right? For us, the body is carnal, but it needs to be mastered, right, by the spirit. 
and and our resurrection would be exactly what we see in the gospels right it's it's christ arising with his body and telling mary you can't touch me yet actually what you just described is is through and through more tied to how Protestants see it as well. So the the whole idea of flesh being carnal and all that other stuff. I don't I don't know if that's how I've experienced the understanding of the interplay between the flesh and the spirit. I I do think in a and this might be what you're referring to the um the Puritan influence of oh what a worm am I and you know the whole idea of we're fallen and some of that other stuff. Um, but how do you view the resurrection? We view the resurrection as where we receive glorified bodies in the same way that Christ did, and we will live forever in a physical, physically restored sense, physically and spiritually restored sense. All right, well, that's different yeah, than I've and, and, to with many, many other Protestants. But Yeah, in fact, I, I don't know if I can say that I've heard a, a divergence from that in a lot of my circles, because we believe that, um, additionally, this is something that we're not, we don't talk about a ton, we don't believe that we spend eternity in heaven. We, we believe that we spend eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. It's a, it's a restored um, physical reality, spiritual and physical reality. Um, so when someone dies and they go to heaven and, and, and then they're resurrected, you don't then spend that eternity in that heavenly realm. You actually spend it in this recreated, restored new heavens and new earth. It talked about in Revelation 21 and all that. So, yeah. Yeah, we actually believe the same thing. Yeah. So, so, so there's a perfect we, example we, we of something that the like earth we, will be renewed yeah yeah and and will become the celestial kingdom mm. yeah. or or a sphere of that a celestial kingdom so to speak sure yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's a perfect example of something that um you know and i do it all the time oh latter-day saints see this completely different and then as i look into it i'm like oh actually they don't you know yeah. sometimes they do sometimes i'm like oh yeah they do see things very different but um this is i think why these conversations are important because it's where we th- have heard some point or, or maybe something wasn't communicated to us clearly at one point when we really set it side by side, a lot of times the beliefs are a little bit more similar than, than we were led to believe. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now you've been reading the book of Mormon. Yep. I just and finished I wanted, second I wanted, Nephi How yesterday. far along are you now? You had already finished first Nephi when we last talked. Yeah. Second Nephi. I just finished that yesterday. Nice. Yep. Uh, so I want to um, get your thoughts on a few things. First of all, just tell me what your thoughts are so far, things that have stood out to you, where you have said, okay, this is interesting, and it pulls me in a little bit, and then where you've recoiled as well. <laughs> well, I'm making videos as I do it. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too much just because sure. I got to save some content for my videos. But I'm also trying to process how I need to communicate it because, again, I'm, I'm at the same trailhead of how do I how do I explore this with Latter-day Saints and evangelicals as I'm on this journey mm-hmm. um because there are certain aspects to it that um aren't they don't seem very foreign to me you know the the references to jesus and god it seems more protestant in its theology than even latter-day saint from my understanding of things um a little bit more of a binary view of the afterlife heaven and hell god's holiness where filth can't uh your sin can't dwell um it's a little bit more um speaks a little bit more in a, in a unified sense. I'm not going to say it's fully Trinitarian, but this idea of one God and you know, three persons um, feels pretty familiar to me. Um, the Whenever I study the scriptures, whenever I, whenever I arrive at the scriptures, um, there's sort of two things that, that I really um, am, am always trying to keep at, at heart. Um, the first one is this is a spiritual thing. This is not academic. God did not reveal his word so that we could go on these academic quests to kind of like forensically dissect it. Um, there, one way to hear the evangelicals talk about it is it's, it's a love letter. It's an invitation to know him, um, his character and his will through Jesus. So uh, whenever I, I sit down with the word of God, there are times where I purposely sit down to not study it, but just to read it and to commune with God. Um, so I was, I'm wanting to, as I'm sitting down with the book of Mormon, I, I don't, I'm coming into it. I don't regard it as scripture that, and that's not even why I'm reading it. And I think that's something that my audience isn't fully, uh, I think most of them are, but not all of them are fully, uh, understanding that I'm not reading the book of Mormon to ponder in my heart. If it's true, I'm an evangelical pastor and I'm, I'm learning 
if I'm going to truly continue to learn and continue to connect with Latter-day Saints, I have to read the Book of Mormon. I mean, that's central. So where there are some who are like hardwired in that missionary mindset of saying, read it, ponder it, and and ask if it's true. Um, I, I'm, I'm still, even though I don't regard it as scripture, and I'm not sitting down with the Book of Mormon to commune with God, that doesn't mean it's not a spiritual experience. That doesn't mean that I'm not, every time I sit down with it, saying, Lord, help me to see the truth clearly. I, I want to hear from you. I want to understand what the truth is. Um, and, and that's really at the heart of what I'm doing. All that said, there is that second aspect of of handling the scriptures, and this is tied more to even pastoral ministry. I mean, pastors will spend anywhere they should at least between eight and 20, maybe longer hours a week studying the Bible and figuring out the best ways to not only understand it, but communicate it and apply it because we're, we're delivering sermons 30, 40, 50 minutes every single week. And <clears throat> So there are a lot of techniques that we use to really get at the meaning of, of a passage of scripture, whether you're talking about one verse or five verses or one chapter or one whole book. So that muscle is really strong just because I, I use it every time I, I go to study and communicate the word of God. So I'm, I, I would be lying if I wasn't. There are a lot of those things that are firing whenever I'm reading the Book of Mormon, historical criticism, textual criticism, form criticism. Um, socio rhetorical criticism. And I'm not even talking when I use the word criticism, I'm not talking about being critical in a negative sense. It's criticism in the in the standpoint of analyzing. When I say historical criticism, I'm asking questions to analyze the historical context sure. of a specific yeah. passage. Critical thinking. There absolutely. are a lot of yeah, critically thinking. Um for anyone who says you need to check your brains at the door when you read the Bible, um, they don't get it. Because <laughs> you don't have to check your brains. Um so as I'm applying some of those things to reading the Book of Mormon, I'm I'm running into, I think, more areas that that get a little bit complicated for me, and um, I have to choose to set certain things aside and move on so I can mm -hmm. keep at it, mm -hmm. because I I do and I will get hung up on um, some of the more what I would say exegetical approaches that I would normally take with the Bible when I apply it to the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. Here, here's a little bit of a a hot question here. What if you're going through this and you're reading it though? Are there times, maybe certain passages or stories, where you think in your mind, does it ever? Because you've been a pastor, right? I mean, it, does it ever come to your mind? Yeah, this is how I would uh, formulate this if I was communicating it and putting it into a sermon, or this is how I would. Uh, this I can see how this would apply to principles that I already agree with, and and how I would communicate this to a congregation. What the, the way? Yeah, the way I would would uh, communicate communicate how I've been framing those things is: Do I believe there are biblical or biblically based truisms mm -hmm. on display? Mm -hmm. And I would say yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, there are times when I'm reading, I'm, I'm like, I'm looking at my notes right now. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too much, but I'm going to show you a page of my notes and everything in yellow is, this is just in second Nephi chapters one through five. Anything you see in yellow are things stated in the book of Mormon that I know are directly tied to things that are stated in the Bible. And this is in the first five chapter of, of second Nephi. So everything in yellow there here on the margin. So in the first five chapters, I'm hearing very direct references to Deuteronomy 11, Romans chapter 8, Genesis chapter 3, Genesis 49, um, a good portion of the Psalms. So yeah, as far as biblical truisms being on display, uh, I absolutely see them in there. Yeah. So as a believer for me, right? So what I look at those things, that is going to be all over the... You're, you, it, it's a wonderful thing to think of you going through this where you have such a great knowledge of the Bible because you're going to find that all the way through. There are going to be certain books, certain prophets in there where it's even heavier and denser. But, uh, you know, and again, I'm just going to talk, I'm, I'm going to talk as if it's true, right? Because mm -hmm. to me it is. Yeah. Um, sure. They've got the brass plates, mm -hmm. right? The brass plates are 
a compilation, not probably of what we see as the Old Testament. And a lot of members don't understand this. It's not a compilation of what was in the Old Testament necessarily, but a lot of it is. Because instead of it being, say, what Judah, the southern kingdom, would have compiled and had as their Old Testament, which is what we have today, right? The, the Masoretic version of right. what had been compiled through all the books in the Old Testament. But it's the northern kingdom. It would be the northern kingdom compilation of, of writings that would be under the legacy of Joseph of Egypt. Okay. Yeah, right? that makes so, sense. Because under Joseph, you have Ephraim who becomes uh, the firstborn, even though he's younger. And then you go down to Joshua, who's an Ephraimite, and you keep going down that that line there. That's why, you, and you'll read this in just a bit when you get to Mosiah, the brass plates are written in Egyptian. Mm -hmm. right? They're written in Egyptian because the legacy goes all the way back up to Joseph. Okay, So the brass plates that they are drawing from, I mean, they, they did enough to, to kill Laban, you read that, to get the brass plates because they had to have it, right? They had to have the scriptures. But they're, a comp they're not the Judahite scriptures. They're the Ephraimite scriptures. Um, so that, why, does Laban, why does Laban have those brass plates? Did, I guess, that, were they brought into his possession prior to the Assyrian exile? Because the northern kingdom would have been in exile so, at that so point. So I, I can only tell you from historical letters and things secondhand that Martin Harris, who is an early member of the church, right? And he's working with Joseph Smith early on. He's lending his money so Joseph Smith can do what he needs to do. He is actually the first scribe to Joseph Smith. And and so the have you heard of the lost 116 pages? Yep. I spent I did a video on Palmyra and learned about the whole Martin okay. Harris. So, so what you're reading in First and Second Nephi is obviously not the lost 116 pages, but the lost 116 pages goes along the same time period. Okay. Okay. So it, it would be the early writings, probably more of Lehi, not Nephi. Mm. Okay. And sometimes we, we call it the Book of Lehi that was lost. We, you know, we don't have the name of the book, but it's mm -hmm. it's that's that's what's lost. But because he had he was the scribe on that and went through those 160 pages and then lost them, he goes all the way from Pennsylvania back to New York in his in his buggy. He's he's got he knows exactly what's in there, and he states to others that Laban was an Ephraimite, mm. right? And and so Zoram, his servant, was also an Ephraimite. Okay, and and so it would be, you know, my assumption here, right, is that that comes down that line. He's probably in line to be the one to hold the records. And he's a general, right? He may not be able to be anything higher than that because he comes, his family comes from the Northern Kingdom. He's an Ephraim, right? He's not gonna ever be in the royal, royal position, right, in Judah. So, and that would be the same with Lehi. Lehi's probably maybe even in the court at Judah, but he's not, he's a man, he's in Manasseh, he's a, he's a Josephite. Mm -hmm. And so that would be why he would have those. Sure, because he he would be in that lineage there. But you'll read. But they're living read it yet, yet. But you'll read in there sir, other prophets that they're talking about that are not in the Book of Mormon, but they refer to that are not in the Old Testament. Hmm. Right. So you've got Zor, uh, uh, Zenic and Zenus and Nehem. Um and when you get to the Book of Jacob, a whole chapter of, in chapter five is in, is the olive branch or the the olive tree allegory. That's all from uh, Zenus, and those would have been prophets from the Northern Kingdom okay. that, that are that are in the in the brass plates. So they're pulling all of this from the brass plates all the way through the Book of Mormon, and it's also, by the way, why the Book of Mormon is written in Egyptian. It's the same thing. They're, it's their it's their spiritual heritage, so to speak. Sure, coming down through jo through Joseph. Sure. Okay, that's a helpful context. Yeah. Did you did you uh, any notes, anything specific on, on 2 Nephi chapter 2? 2 Nephi there, chapter Lehi's 2. Lehi's discourse on opposition in all things. Adam fell that man might be, and then are that they might have joy. Yes, I, my my note here, verses 23 through 26, sound very familiar with, sound similar to Romans 5, 12 through 21 about the fall. 
um, and and all have fallen through Adam, um, awesome. and then eventually in Romans have That's been restored through the one man Jesus. So yeah, yeah, yeah. There's another thing, and I'll just bring it up real fast here. But I, you're, you're going to get toward the end of the Book of Mormon with Mormon and Moroni. You're going to get faith with the chariot. Mm. And and it's like, well, wait a minute here. That's not even in the Old Testament. Words, words, words. Hey, that's one of those other th- thought processes that you're having as you go through this. It's like, you're just borrowing it from the Virgin in the New Testament, right? And he's just putting this in. And it's like, well, it's probably in the brass place, right? There's probably even an older version of, of what Paul may be pulling from is, is how we would look at that mm-hmm. as we're okay. going through that. Um, yeah. anything else stick out that you, you can, you don't, we, I know you don't want to leave the cat out of the bag here, but was there anything? Yeah. I mean, did you, what, what did you think of Lehi's dream? Does that seem applicable? Uh, in the first, first portion of first Nephi. Yes. Yeah. The, first the Nephi, tra- what, eight, I think it starts and yeah. And then Nephi, um, Nephi goes through the same thing. Yeah. I mean, some of my notes here, um, it, I, I found it interesting I was seeing again a tie to with the tree of life. There's a reference in uh, verse one about there being seeds of every kind. That language being borrowed from Genesis chapter one. Um, there's sort of a <clears throat> recreation, in a sense, tied to the tree of life. That's tied to uh, the the original creation. Mm-hmm. Um, I had some questions, which were later answered. You know, I've got question marks. Who is who? What is the building of scoffers? Who do they represent? I have a question here, but I know that that's answered a little bit further down. Um, but yeah. And then I know Nephi is also given the same, same vision and a little bit more detail. So, yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Uh, I did want to finish up just going a few, over a few different differences, just kind of talking about some of the differences that evangelicals will have in their theology as compared to Latter-day Saints. Yeah. Uh, you did a, an episode on the three levels of heaven. What is your thought on that? On, on there being three different levels of heaven. I mean, it's it's not a, just a binary for us, right? It's right. It's right. like hell for us is it, it, it's two things, right? There's like a spiritual hell, which is more along the lines of what you have to go through. There can be hell on earth. Sure, there can be payment for your sins, and maybe that's a part of what where the afterlife is. But for us, there's only one place that kind of is really hell, which is outer darkness, which is you're done. Sure. Right. It, for yeah. hell for the very, very worst of, of, of the children of God. And everybody yeah. else is somewhere in heaven, but just at different sure. levels. Yeah. So from an evangelical perspective, we, we do believe that there are certain, um, I don't think I would call them levels. I, I think there would be certain aspects of how, how is that glory manifested in the afterlife? And where is that glory snuffed out or, or where doesn't it exist from the standpoint of someone not uh, existing eternally in, in the presence of God. Um, I think there's been a little bit of a mythologizing or a, even a, a glazing over of the, the origin of what hell is in evangelical theology. And we think of it as, you know, the place of fire with, you know, demons running around poking people with pitchforks type of thing. And um, I, I do think from, from our standpoint, we, we definitely believe that there is a place where there is eternal anguish, the anguish is, is tied more to being separated from our rightful created place. And that is in the presence of God almighty and where we are eternally uh, separated from that. That is, that is a, a hellish um, place. We don't necessarily, uh, it, it, this gets a little bit semantical, so I don't, I'm not, I'm not writing this in stone tablets, but I think it's important just to understand that we're, we're not necessarily thinking that God is on this mission to send people to hell. And I think that's how the Protestant or even Catholic God can be seen. He's he's not. We are already on the path to hell because we are fallen beings, because we're in our sin. It, it is not that that there's a God running around wanting to send people to hell. There's actually God running around rescuing people who are already headed there. And, and that rescue mission is manifested through his son, Jesus. So then how that then um, plays into eternity, we would say that there's the Bema Seat of Christ where... Uh, for all intents and purposes, that is a judgment of um, your deeds, but is not necessarily tied to your eternal destination. Uh, that would be the the great white throne judgment at the end of all things. Um, but but that there is a moment or a point at which um, those where the culling sort of takes place, and those who are truly um, reconciled to God Almighty um, will spend eternity with Him, and those who aren't. Um, are not. 
Now, in a reform saturated way of thinking in 20th century, 21st century theology, um, things have gotten pretty rigid. I think pushing against any sort of idea of universalism to, to say then, and if, if there are people like Native Americans who never heard of the gospel, well, That's where I was going. Yeah. it stinks to be them. You know, they're just, they're in hell forever because there's this logical progression that people will take that like, well, they just weren't the elect. They didn't hear the gospel, so they can't go to heaven. Um, that's a pretty rigid view. I, I think you're leaning a little majority, more into Calvinism. Yeah. And I think for the vast majority of, of evangelicals at this point, you're going to, there's a residue of that around because that was, I think kind of more prevalent in 20th century theology. It's not necess- it's not leaning into universalism, but it's also saying we're not going to speculate there. We believe that God is righteous. We believe that he is the judge and we believe that he will judge rightly and he will judge within his goodness and his grace. Um, we'll leave that to him. We don't need an answer there. Um, we can we can have faith in the fact that he's going to take care of that, how it needs to be taken care of. But we don't believe that there's multiple levels of heaven in the sense that based on, um, you know, whether you fulfilled certain requirements, you get to higher level. Um, we just, we believe that God is redeeming us back into the garden with him. And whether you are a worker at 6 a.m. or at noon or in the final hour of the day, um, it that redemption is redemption. And those who are redeemed spend eternity with him. So, yeah. So on our end, what you know, that's a big part of why we do all that the, the temple work we do. Right. So right. we're 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 doing the covenants, the baptisms for the dead, right? And all the covenants that we do in the temple, you do that for yourself once. Right. So when you go through the first time, it's like it's like I mean, how do I it's like baptisms about baptism on steroids, right? It's like it's like you're doing a vin, a, additional covenants beyond what your baptism would be, right? Sure. And uh, but again, going back to the idea of the body, um, we believe that has to be done in a physical body. And so but you can do it by proxy, kind of like Christ suffered in on the cross and in Gethsemane with a body in his body for us. Right. Sure. It's done by proxy. So for us, it's kind of like it's Christ like. Right. We're 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 going through in our bodies, going through the covenants that we believe are saving ordinances, right, for others so that everybody, Native Americans, everybody who's ever been on the earth has the opportunity to accept or deny, accept or deny those things, and that they will all be taught. For us, when Christ leaves uh, the earth uh, after the cross and is gone for those three days, he's, he's preaching or organizing in the afterlife, right? To have the sure. missionaries and have all the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ put out there. And then they, it's just like here, right? We can accept something or, or turn it away. We can accept the ordinances or turn them away. But for us, that gives everybody the exact same opportunity, whether it's on this earth and in this mortality or not, everybody has the chance, so to speak, to be baptized, we'll say, right? Everybody sure. has the chance sure. to hear the gospel and to accept it or or not, mm-hmm. etc. Yeah. So that's kind yeah. of on our end. Uh, the uh, we we talked about this when when we were when, previously, but I'll just ask you again: Do we believe in the same Jesus? <laughs> it's a million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> um, that that is my pursuit. Uh, on one hand, there there is a part of me that says, um. I mean, we're talking about the Jesus born in Nazareth to a virgin. Yeah, we're probably talking about the same Jesus. But then there's other aspects to his origin. Um, and, you know, the spirit brother, brother of Lucifer, um, mm. all that other stuff that um, I'm like, yeah, that's that's a different guy. When, I've heard one person describe it before. It's like, do we have the same mom? It's like, well, we we both have an individual from whom we were birthed that we call mom. And, you know, we grew in her womb in similar ways and, and all that other stuff. And we have a similar relationship with her. So we, we believe in that we, we have the same mom, right? It's like, well, not necessarily like in title and, and um, function. Uh, yes. But 
um, is, does that mean it's the same exact person? And I think that's a million dollar question that, that I'm even pursuing. Is it, do we believe in a different Jesus or do we believe in different things about the same Jesus? And I think that's, that's part of a lot of what I'm, I'm exploring on the channel. Yeah. Yeah. I think what I was saying, uh, when we talked about that was, I think to me, the biggest difference is, is nature, right? In other words, we, we both believe in the child that was born in Bethlehem to Mary, and that's who we worship, right? We, we both believe that he grew grace by grace, grace for grace and, and taught in parables and healed and suffered and died in Gethsemane and on the cross and was resurrected and is whether you, you know, you know, and then I was gonna say, and is the son of God, what that's where we start talking about nature, the mm -hmm. nature of God beyond that, yeah. I think. And that that's where things kind of get a little bit different. Yeah, but they do. Saying, you know, the, the most important thing to me, as I look at those things, is I say, okay, for Jeff, Jesus Christ is his savior. He paid for his sins and, and sacrificed everything through love. And I think that part, by the way, but the love part is very important compared to other religions outside of Christianity. Yes. And in, in the condescension, right, of lowering yes. yourself. And, uh, and, uh, and, and that's what I believe, right? I believe those things. And that's the, that's the core of my belief mm -hmm. is Jesus Christ died, suffered, and was resurrected in that last week and then it's like okay beyond that now now we've we've got some yeah. nature of god uh, I, I will uh, maybe dis discrepancies i'll press my answer in more of a practical realm a little bit further and that is i have talked to people and there's one guy in particular i'm thinking of right now that i've talked to who is a latter-day saint um he personally feels that uh, doctrine and religious practices have sort of become burdensome to his understanding of God and Jesus and some of these other things. And he feels like that sometimes Latter-day Saints major on the minors and miss the, the point or the heart of the law. Um, but that he still is a practicing Latter-day Saint. And he, with a quivering voice and tears running down his face, said, I, when I think about what Jesus did on the cross for me to redeem me, to bring me out of my sinfulness to a place of restoration before God, um, he's like, I, I'm eternally grateful for that. I, if it wasn't for Jesus, I would have no hope. And listen, I don't care where you go to church on Sunday morning. If that's a testimony that you're, you're proclaiming to me, I'm not going to tell you you're not a Christian. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you like that. That is a, that is a sacred proclamation that he is testifying to that, um, ultimately it's between him and God in the same way that ultimately my salvation is between me and God. But um, that's where some Christians might want to press in and be like, yeah, but, and try to then disqualify that testimony. And I'm not going to do that. I, mm -hmm. I think there's a, a beautiful proclamation of God's not only saving work through Jesus, but the hope that he, that he brings that, um, that I'm good with. So, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Well, Jeff, where, where do you plan on taking the channel? What are your, what are your future plans with this? I'm actually wanting to be focusing on it even more just in, in, from a, a time and resources standpoint. It's been a side project and it just seems to be resonating with so many people. And it seems to be, in my mind, clarifying in, in its importance, um, why this is an important conversation for us to have, um, that we um, that we continue to strive on this path together. Uh, I'm hoping to be able to put more time into it in 2023. I would love to eventually do a podcast um, and to have more of a conversational interview type of style in addition to Hello Saints. As far as videos that are coming up, um, it's reading the Book of Mormon. I think I'm gonna, I, I was going to release like four to six videos. It's probably going to be more like seven to 10 videos as I'm kind of getting keep, through it. Keep them going like um, that. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll be doing that. I'm, I'm going to be going to church for the first time. Um, I'm, I've got an idea for a video I'd love to do. I was supposed to do it last month, but it didn't work out. Going to Nashville, Tennessee, you know, this is on the buckle of the Bible Belt. And doing a man on the street uh, interview with Bible Belt evangelicals, uh, what do you think of Latter Day Saints? What what is your understanding of the Restoration and of Mormonism? Uh, I'm telling you guys, that's going to be a, a fascinating uh, uh, video if and when I can pull it off. Um, and I think lastly, I'm I'm also going to be kind of. Um, I'm wanting to bring Latter Day Saints into my experience and get their 
perspective. Uh, I've, I've already talked to a couple that I want, I want them to come to church with me mm -hmm. and give me their thoughts and their perspectives and, and some of that stuff. So um, I don't know. I'll continue to, to forge this path of um, uh, charity and dignity um, and respect, even if there are areas where we disagree, but to also find commonalities in Christ so we can talk about these important things that we're talking about today. So, well, I think one of the things that re that resonates with Latter Day Saints so much is you have this conscientious uh, manner of of bringing these things to you know not bringing them to light to Latter Day Saints, but watching you have them brought to light, right, and and seeing mm -hmm. you explore this and and, uh, uh, and and you're you're just a good guy. You're a good guy, <laughs> and and so it's it's easy to put a little trust there, right? A little a little mm -hmm. bit of hey, okay, I, I can listen to this guy. I want to hear yeah. what he has to say and then actually turn that into, well, I'm really excited to hear what he has to say about the Book of Mormon. And, yeah. and, and coming from a, an evangelical pastor's perspective, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, well, that's kind of you to say. And I mean, honestly, it really does come from a heart that, that absolutely positively believes that Latter-day Saints are worth every ounce of dignity and respect um, as we talk through these things. And I think for too long, there's been a, a demeaning to the point of almost dehumanizing Latter-day Saints when it comes to where they they diverge from Orthodox Christian thinking. Um, where we can treat each other with charity and, and dignity, that's where relationship takes place. And where relationship exists is where life exists. And where life exists, that's where things get really exciting because we connect and that's what we're, we're built for. So the fact that individuals are feeling connected to this effort and that my heart is um, being well received um, I, it is reciprocal, like whatever kindness people are, are getting off, you know, perceiving from my vibe, I'm getting the same perception from Latter-day Saints, which is why this is sort of snowballing because there's a, there's a, um, a return kindness and invitation, um, and really respect that I've been receiving from Latter-day Saints, which is why I think this is just, it's a good match. So. Awesome. Jeff, thanks so much. Again, appreciate you coming onto the, onto the, uh, show his youtube channel is hello saints go check it out i think you'll really enjoy it thanks for coming on jeff thanks for having me